Good morning, church. Welcome on this fifth Sunday in Lent to Mount Tam United Methodist Church. My name is Luke. I have the honor and privilege to serve as pastor here. And whether you're joining us in person or online, we're so glad to have you with us. If you are joining us online, feel free to uh, type into the chat, share what's happening in your life or where you're coming from, connect with one another through that chat. We just uh, want you to feel like you can be a part of this worship uh, as fully as possible, even if you're not physically with us. And thank you again for joining us in that way. For those who are here, in your bulletins you will find a couple of things that we've put in for the past few weeks. A reminder that Easter lily forms are due at the end of this month on March 31st. You only have a few days left to get these in. So if you'd like to honor or remember somebody with Easter lilies, please do so. And also we have these wonderful little invitation and reminder cards. You can either place these on your refrigerator uh, to remember what we have happening during Easter, or if you have a neighbor or friend that you'd like to share these with, you are welcome to do that as well. Trisha, do you have an announcement for us too? I'm gonna to invite Trisha to come up and share with us during this time. No problem. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I am making the same announcements that I made last week, but I wanted to make them again because they are important. So the first is that our directories are available. If you didn't get one last week, you can see me after the service to get one, or you can stop by the church office during the week. Um, the next is that if you brought home one of the Easter buckets for Oma Village, they are due next Sunday. So please finish filling them with goodies and bring them back to church next week. And then also next week after church, we will be doing our egg stuffing for the egg hunt uh, on Easter Sunday. So if you can stay and help out, that would be great. And if you can uh, bring candy or little stickers or little things to go in the plastic eggs, we would really appreciate it. Those can be brought uh, either during uh, the week at church in the office or on next Sunday. And so maybe drop me a line and let me know if you're planning on picking up candy or goodies to stuff the eggs with. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tricia. There are many other things in addition to these announcements happening in the life of our church. So I invite you to take your bulletin home with you. On the back, you can see all of the different things coming up and there are um, some special highlighted events too, such as our upcoming Sierra Service Project uh, for youth uh, and uh, our Peace Camp for children. So please make sure to take this home with you, look through it closely so you can see all of the wonderful things happening in the life of our church. At this time, I would like to invite you to please stand as you are able for our call to worship. Friends, let us gather today in the presence of the Lord. We come to this place eager to be renewed. In Ezekiel's vision, the Lord showed him a valley filled with dry bones and asked him, can these bones live? We believe that with God, all things are lost. We arrive here with concerns and brokenness, but we trust in the power of God's word to bring us together and make us whole. So let us worship the Lord, who can take what is dry and lifeless and bring it to life with a single breath. Let us lift up our voices in praise and thanksgiving to God, who can make all things Amen. Please remain standing as you are able for our opening song. It's number 600 in the hymnal, Wonderful Words of Life. And the candle's already lit up there, so you can...
seated. If you open up your bulletin to the first page, you will find our opening prayer, and the words are printed in bold, which invites us to say this prayer together. Gracious God, we gather seeking your guidance. As we enter into this time of worship, we pray that you would open our hearts and minds to receive your word. May your spirit speak to us in new and profound ways. May we leave this place inspired to go out into the world and make a difference in your name. Amen. At this time, I'd like to invite our young people to come forward for our young person's moment as we all sing, This is Where Children Belong. for helping with that food for the food bank. A reminder that each Sunday we collect food for the Marin County Food Bank. So if you have something you'd like to donate, you can bring it to church, set it in the center aisle, and then our young folks will bring it up here and we'll make sure it gets donated. So today, as you notice, I'm standing, so nobody needs to sit yet. We can keep standing. Perfect. Come on up. Come on up. Great job. Caleb behind you. There's a little bit more. All right. And we can stay standing because today we're going to do a standing children's moment. When I was young, Caleb, when I was about your age, and I, I loved reading, but sometimes I wanted to take a break from reading words and just look at pictures, I looked through a book that you may have heard before of before. I don't know if we have any in our house or not. It's called Where's Waldo? And Where's Waldo was, was a, a little man with glasses and a beanie cap and a striped shirt, and he'd be in a picture full of a bunch of other people and things happening, and you'd have to closely look at the picture and find where Waldo was. So I was thinking about Where's Waldo this week, and I thought for Children's Moment, we might do something a little different and look around our sanctuary, and we can even walk around a little bit, and think about the places we might see images or reminders of God. And I have a feeling as we start doing this, we'll realize there's a lot more here than we might have realized. So let's just start looking around, and do we notice anything that might remind us about God? What about, oh, you got one, what? That's right, our stained glass windows, like the one you're pointing at, shows Jesus, and he's above the disciples, and, and we see lots of different images from the Bible, some stories from the Old Testament, and then some from the New about Jesus, and each window tells us a story about our faith and about how God was working in our world. So yes, the windows all around us remind us of God. Do we see anything else? I see the pulpit here, and sometimes I stand here and share a sermon about God, or sometimes on Sunday we have a reader who stands here and reads from the Bible and reminds us about God, so the pulpit might do that. Anything else? Yeah. The cross. Yeah, the cross on there, and we have crosses up on the window in front, and we have a cross here on the altar, lots of crosses reminding us of Jesus. And I also see a Bible up here. So not only do we share the words of the Bible from the pulpit, we also have a Bible here. And you know what I'm seeing? I'm seeing these candles, these candles um, that you, Caleb, uh, lit as acolyte today. And do you know what those candles symbolize? They symbolize the light of Jesus, the light of God in all of us. So when you light those candles, you're part of bringing in a symbol a reminder of God. Okay, we'll do a couple more. What about those folks in, in uh, those robes back there? What do they do? 
They sing. They sing songs. They sing hymns and songs that remind us about God. The choir reminds us about God through sharing their gifts and talents of music. Anything else? Yeah. Yes, the rocks and wood. The wood might remind us of the wood of the cross and the rocks. Uh, there's lots of stories about rocks in the Bible of God giving water through rocks, about Jesus calling people like the Apostle Peter, the rock of the church. Rocks are a very important image and reminder of God. Okay, one more, one, two more, and then I'll be done, I promise. Because we could go on all day, I think, looking at all these. The food that you both brought up This reminds me of God because one of the invitations Jesus gave to us is to help people who need food, to share what we have, to feed one another. So we're remembering Jesus every Sunday we bring up food. All right, this is going to be the last one, even though there are lots more. Well, okay, I'll let you have one more and then I'll give my last one. Yeah, color purple, which is a liturgical color for this season of preparing for Easter. Yes, that is an important reminder of this season we are in and preparing ourselves for the story of Easter. Now, I want you to turn around and let's all try to look at everybody across here. Look at one another. Guess what? What? The Bible teaches us that every single person in this room is a reflection of our creator God. So when we are in church and we look at one another, and later on in the service we have a time where we pass peace to one another, that's a reminder that each person, you, me, we all are creations of God and we all give a glimpse of the amazingness of God in creation. Isn't that wonderful? Just think about how many more symbols could be in here, but I know you have to get to Sunday school, so I'm going to let you go. But remember, when we come into this sanctuary, God is all around us. So I'm going to pray, and if anybody wants to repeat after me, you are welcome to do so. Dear God, thank you. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the people of this church. Thank you for all of the reminders that you are with us. Amen. And now before we go to Sunday school, we're going to hear the choir and experience that gift of music so we can just sit down and listen to the choir.
Good morning. Today's scripture passage comes to us from the 37th chapter of the book of Ezekiel. Now, in 587 BCE, Jerusalem was conquered by the Babylonians, Solomon's temple was destroyed, and many Judeans, including Ezekiel, were taken into captivity in Babylon. Ezekiel's vision of the dry bones coming to life symbolizes God's promise to restore his exiled people to their home. Please join me in the prayer. Gracious God, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scripture is read and your word proclaimed, we may hear what you say to us today. Amen. The hand of the Lord was on me, and God brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. God led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. God asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then God said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. Then God said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come, breath, from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Praised be thou, O Lord our God. King of the universe, who inspires prophetic writings. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. As this passage is so focused on breath and life, let us take a moment to pay attention to our breathing recognizing that each breath of life is a gift. Will you pray with me? God, as we encounter this story, may your breath of life 
empower us, enlighten us, and give us the ability to apply these words to our life today. I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts remain holy, acceptable, and pleasing in your sight. Amen. So by a show of hands, and I hope nobody's bashful about this, how many folks in here are familiar with the Bible passage we just heard? When you heard that story, how much of it sounded, oh, I've heard this one before. Okay, yeah, so not a lot, maybe, maybe a fifth, 20% of people in here are familiar with this story. And, and I've come to find that over the years, that this is one of those stories that seems to slip under the radar. It's not usually told or taught in Sunday school. It's not preached on very often. And of course, it's a, it's a relatively intense story, bones, flesh coming together, coming back to life. In our modern world, it can drum up images of a horror movie or a zombie-themed TV show. Yet, to those who first heard this story and vision, it was not meant to inspire fear or be a spooky campfire story. It was meant to give hope. It was meant to be a promise of a renewed future for God's people. Just like any story we read in Scripture, it's important and necessary for us to understand the background and context which this, this vision occurs. And again, I want to make it crystal clear that this is a vision. It's a vision. It's a dream. It's not something that the Bible says literally happened. This is what Ezekiel is seeing in his mind. And so it's important for us to know who Ezekiel was, what his background, and why he would even have this vision in the first place. Ezekiel was born in a priestly lineage of Israel. His ancestors before him were priests in the first temple of Jerusalem, and so he was given that same responsibility and training. He began his life at the epicenter of the Hebrew culture, training and working at the place where the people believed was the, the meeting point between the divine and earth. However, by his mid-twenties, his whole life and Israel's whole life took a dramatic turn when the Babylonian Empire came in and took over, displacing Ezekiel and countless others in the process. In these first few years of exile, Ezekiel's visions and prophecies were focused on the themes that we encountered with lots of the other prophets when we looked at some of the minor prophets last year in a sermon series on them. Ezekiel joined the chorus saying that because people had lost their way and were ignoring God's justice and were not being faithful to the covenant in which they entered with God, that this tragedy was taking place. If you were here last week, I touched on the fact that this disalignment between the people and God actually was at the very foundation of the beginning of the kingdom. For God did not intend for Israel or the Hebrews to have a king at all. Another prophet, a man named Samuel, through him God told the people that their demands for an earthly king like all of the empires around them would end in brokenness. Yet the people demanded a king, an earthly king and kingdom anyways. And like many loving parents, God allowed the people to have their kingdom and their king, even if it meant that they would learn from their own mistakes and grow out of their mistakes. And so here we have the exile. It's taking place. The temple in which Ezekiel worked in and his ancestors was now destroyed. But after prophesizing that the harsh reality would happen and why it was happening, Ezekiel's visions began to shift. They shifted from the why this was happening to the what comes next. 
And just like we are preparing for Easter, the day where we celebrate resurrection, so too did Ezekiel, through God's leading, prepare the people for a day of resurrection to come, a vision of restored life that was to come. As we heard in this vision, the prophet sees a valley full of dry bones, and the text itself kind of interprets what this means for us, that it is the people who have lost their way coming back together, their faith and their spirituality being renewed as a return to God, which is exactly why this passage is so perfect for the season of Lent, as as the church wrestles with these same ideas in preparation for Holy Week. We've been in a time of fasting, of repentance, of somewhat quiet and reflective, and it's all leading to a day of life. And reflecting on this passage, I can't help but remember that in many ways, We, too, are in a bit of a disbursement or diaspora. We are in a time when many congregations are closing or are dividing. There's a huge clergy shortage developing as fewer and fewer young people are entering vocational ministry. And this this is a startling statistic to hear, but I think it's important for us to always be honest in acknowledging the situation around us. It's very likely that in the next 10 years, one-third of our United Methodist congregations in Northern California and Nevada will be closing. One-third. This isn't just a Methodist thing. Our Lutheran, Baptist, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Congregationalist, and Catholic siblings are experiencing the same thing. And because of that, many are panicking. Some think the answer to fix this is legislating our faith and values. Others think the answer is self-righteousness and believing that even if everybody else leaves, God will reward me for being the last one that closes the doors, for sticking with it. Some think the answer is yelling at folks on a street corner through a bullhorn. Others have just thrown in the towel and given up, not knowing what to do. But this passage reminds us that the year 2023 is not the first time that people of faith have been confronted with challenges. It happened in Ezekiel's time. It happened in Jesus' time when folks argued about the best way to overcome the Roman Empire. Was it by fighting them with the zealots or was it by being pacifists or collaborating and working with the empire? Was it just running away to the desert like the Essenes did and separating themselves from everyone and everything? It's happened before when churches in history have become more focused on military campaigns or crusades to revitalize the institution rather than anything else. It's happened when the church began um, in the Middle Ages and 1500s that, that the church began selling indulgences. Remember that from history class? Buying a quicker way to heaven. Maybe that'll be the answer forward. It's happened when ships full of Christians had to sail across the sea to avoid religious persecution by other Christians. Our denomination, Methodism, was rooted and founded in a time where a priest in the Church of England saw a dying church, a church that was so caught up in rules and rituals and pomp and circumstance that it forgot to connect with the people outside of its walls. 
It's a common thread that emerges over and over in history as people strive to break out of patterns of death and complacency. And often, the cycle is broken through new life. The reformers allowing people to read and hear the scriptures spoken in their own languages, applying it in a more relevant way to their lives. Early Christianity spreading across the Roman Empire through story, through visiting homes, through family members traveling on the roads that the empire developed. Our Methodism emerging out of that founder who instead of staying in the walls of the church, went to the universities, went to the coal mines, went to the open air fields to tell the story of life to people who weren't in the church. As I look back through history at this cycle and this ebb and flow and this worry and the new life, a theme begins to emerge. And I sum up that theme in two words. Authentic relationship. The way forward over and over again seems to be when people of faith remember the importance of authentic relationship. Authentic relationship with God, authentic relationship with one another, and last but certainly not least, authentic relationships with those who are outside of our community. And an authentic relationship, in my opinion, begins when we start caring about others without bringing in an agenda of our own. And I'll be honest with you, this was not what I was planning on preaching on today. Today I was planning on just focusing on new life and the fact that the church is supposed to be the place that when we walk out on Sundays we should feel like we have more life than when we came in. But everything changed this very morning. The sermon was rewritten in its entirety a couple hours ago. Because when I walked in the office this morning, I found these two small pocket Bibles. You may have seen these somewhere in your life. Uh, these Bibles were being handed out. Actually, I'm going to let this letter speak for itself. There was also an attached letter with these Bibles from some of our neighbors across the street, some middle schoolers. They wrote this. We were given these in front of Mill Valley Middle School. They just kind of handed them to us. We did not know what to do, dot, dot, dot. We are not sure if the people who were handing them out go to this church, and we just wanted to be respectful and not waste them. And so we returned them. Some people think the answer to breaking the cycle of death or complacency is handing out Bibles. Handing out Bibles with no relationship formed. Clearly, these people didn't even identify where they were from. They weren't from our church passing them out, passing them out, not sharing their names, not sharing why, and clearly starting that whole process with an agenda. Kind of reminds me of how there were the bones, there was the structure, there was even new life coming together, yet until God 
advised Ezekiel to do so, there was no breath. Sometimes we, in our desperation for wanting to kickstart back up life, we just throw the bones at it. And we forget the breath, the beginning, the thing that we do in our very first moment of life. The thing that acknowledges that our independent life, disconnected from our mother, begins that first breath. As we encounter the cycles of history, as we are in one of these cycles where the church is trying to figure out what's next, may we remember that it starts with breath, that it starts with connection, that it starts with relationship. We don't close ourselves off thinking we're better than others. We don't turn on one another thinking, oh, if we just did it this way, if you just were like this, we wouldn't be in this problem. Instead, let us trust in the power of God working through us, just like God worked through Ezekiel, that in being in relationship with one another, that naturally that interest and invitation and hope for a new day and community building, both inside these walls of a church and outside in the church of the world, the open-air church, it will take place. That's what our scriptures affirm to us. That's what our history affirms to us. It all starts with relationship. So if you're at a point in your faith or even in another aspect of your life where you're not sure where to go, I invite you to consider simply going to another recognizing just like we talked about in the children's moment that each one of us, no matter where we are on life's journey, is a reflection of God. That each one of us, through the way we care about one another, through the way we speak to one another, through the way we simply acknowledge one another's existence, we are preaching a gospel that is louder than any Bible handed without explanation could ever do. Amen. At this time, I'd invite you to remain seated as we join together in our next hymn. It's number 2152 in the Faith We Sing songbook, Change My Heart, O God. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me, this is what I pray, change my heart, oh God, make it ever true.
one of the ways we are invited to share in the work of the church is through the sharing of our gifts. As we take up our offering, may we remember the words of Jesus, that where we place our treasure, so too will be our heart. God, we are grateful for all of the gifts in our life. In response to all that we have been given, we offer back this portion for the work of your church, praying that these gifts may be used according to your holy and perfect will as we strive to be a church that is in authentic relationship with you, one another, and our neighbors. Amen. You may be seated. get the iPad here for our prayer time. During this time of prayer, we enter into a sacred practice that has been around since the foundations of the church, recognizing that part of authentic relationship is celebrating the joys that each one of us carry together, as well as comforting and supporting one another through the trials and difficulties of our personal lives, our communal lives, and our world. I want to lift up a prayer of gratitude from Jane O'Brien for the renewal of spring, blooming trees, and wildflowers on the hills. We lift this prayer to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. I want to lift up a common thread on the, uh, the chat online and the gift and thanksgiving for Dan's reading today and sharing with us of the story. We give thanks for the way in which his words help that story come alive for us. We lift this prayer to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Karen Jernstead asks that, I lift up a prayer of thanksgiving and gratitude for all of the kind words, 
from her church family, all of the ways that you have all come to support her and her family during this time where she and her family is mourning the loss of her mother. And even in that mourning, she also gives thanks for her mother's long and fruitful life. And indeed, we celebrate the fact that her mother's influence and life lessons are carried on in Karen and her family, and that we celebrate to the promise that our story on earth is not the end of God's story for us. We lift these prayers to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Our next prayer is a prayer of joy mixed with a little bit of an announcement. Um, Today is Kristen Choi's birthday. Kristen is still out in Pittsburgh at school. I think she'll be coming back uh, in in May. But we are going to celebrate her and remember that our connections span even across the country. And her family has brought in a delicious birthday cake that was picked up this morning fresh before church. And so You are invited for fellowship time after the service to have some cake, and I think we might even uh, have a a few videos going around, a few cameras to wish Kristen happy birthday, and so we can send our greetings and love to her in Pittsburgh. But we give thanks for her life, we give thanks for the celebration of another year lived, and we pray for her as she uh, wraps up this year of college and as uh, finals begin to approach that the stress and worry and anxiety may uh, not be overwhelming and that she might just be able to succeed in all that is put in front of her. We lift these prayers to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. What prayers, joys, or concerns do you bring with you this morning that you would like to lift up? Yes. Yes. We lift up prayers that God's healing spirit and comforting spirit may be at work in your arthritis, that as you seek care and, and, and medicine for that, that the right healing and treatments might be available. We pray for your siblings who are in a time where they might need direction, they might need comfort, and that just God's spirit is at work among your family as next steps are planned for and taken. We lift these prayers to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Others. Yes. And and her first name? Carol. Carol. Prayers for Carol as she is being diagnosed with ALS and being, being evaluated for that. Prayers that the right treatment plan and the right life plan might be put in place. Prayers for understanding amongst all of the different steps that need to be taken and the changes that will be uh, made and need to be made in Carol's life with this diagnosis and with this evaluation. We lift up prayers of strength for her family and prayers, God, that ultimately your peace will prevail despite new challenges. We lift these prayers to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Yes. We lift up prayers for Dennis's uncle Sean, who passed away this week. We give thanks for all of the positive lessons that Sean illustrated to his friends and family, 
and we give thanks for the learnings that came from the mistakes that Sean may have made in his life. And we pray for the family during this time of mourning. May they have peace, may they have understanding, and may they take the best of who Sean was and carry that in their hearts and their lives forward as we celebrate again, God, the promise that life on earth is not an end to our story. We lift these prayers to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Yes, Gail. Mm. And uh, it affected my life greatly with human help and prayer and function. It has resurrected and it's <laughs> working the way it did, and I don't need to go yet to a blood test, <laughs> for which I'm grateful because it's familiar and I can remember how to use it. New life, even in the circuit boards of your computer. But what we really lift up as a prayer is the the means to be in authentic relationship with folks that are even far away that we are no longer physically close to. We give thanks for all of the ways, God, that we are able to connect and check in with those we love and care about. And may we not take for granted the gifts we have in this technology, and may we not um, give in to the excuses of not checking in with loved ones who are far away. May we uh, use this technology to stay in authentic relationship with one another. We lift these prayers to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Any others? Yes, Mary Michael. Jill. We lift up Jill who's undergoing treatment for stage four pancreatic cancer, a very, very serious cancer. We pray for Jill's medical team. We pray that the treatment may achieve the best possible outcomes, outcomes beyond even anybody's hope, that it might be even better. God, we pray for those who surround Jill during this trying time. Give them the strength to support her. Give them the wisdom to know when to speak and when to just be a silent yet steady presence in Jill's life. We pray for Jill's family who no doubt has a wide array of emotions ranging from sadness to anger God, be present in this very difficult situation. Show us the way. May we see you at work in Jill's life. We lift these prayers to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Any others? Yes, Barbara. We give thanks for this congregation around us, for each soul that finds their way to this place, for the ways that we experience beautiful community. It is such a gift from God, such a gift from you, O oh Lord. We lift this prayer to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Yes, Marco. Oh, oh, what's that? Oh, yes, absolutely. Tomorrow's your birthday. That is definitely a joy worth celebrating. So give thanks for another year, another trip around the sun. And God, we just pray that this upcoming year might uh, be a continued year of growth for family. And, and we just give thanks for Marco's life and all that's yet to come. We lift this prayer to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Anything else? 
Stephanie? We continue to pray for Rudy, whose treatment for lymphoma has sent him back to the ER multiple times this week with um, dehydration and malnourishment. God, may his medical providers find the right dosages and the right treatment in order to avoid these severe side effects. And may your spirit be at work in his life in ways that go beyond our understanding to keep him strong, to allow him to endure this difficult treatment. We lift these prayers to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Any others? Yes, Jeff. Um, our son Kevin got accepted into uh, Army Medical School. Wow. Two days notice. Wow. Yes, prayers for Kevin and, and his successful six weeks of training with the Army Medical Corps as he continues to live out his vocation of being an emergency medical responder and being there um, when people need him the most. God, may your spirit of protection surround him and may he be strengthened in all that he has to learn and study in order to be the best medic he can be. We lift these prayers to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Anything else? I invite us to take a moment in silent prayer. God of new life, God of birthdays, God of unexpected blessings, we have so much to be grateful for. There has been healing, there has been hope, there has been celebration in our lives. Help us to not take any of these good moments or milestones for granted. Help us to cherish them and cherish you. God, we also have so much weighing heavy on our shoulders. Friends and family and ourselves who are dealing with medical difficulties or new diagnoses, folks who are struggling with the side effects of treatment, folks who are trying to figure out just the next step in their life, finding new direction, finding stability, finding a new way of being in the world. Some of us gather in this place mourning the loss of a loved one or friend. God, help us. Help us to live in to the promise that life doesn't end on this earth. That somebody's impact doesn't end when their last breath has been taken, but that they live on through us, they live on through you, until the day of this mysterious, awe-inspiring thing that we call resurrection. God, we don't always know, actually we very rarely know how it works, but we trust 
We trust in this promise. We trust in you. God, help us to be worthy of authentically trusting one another, loving one another with the same kind of love that Jesus shared with his disciples, with his friends. Help us to remember that every single one of us on our best days and even on our worst days still reflects your light for our face, our being is a reflection of you. And every breath we take is a testimony to the life, the gift of life you have given us. God, for all of the other prayers that have been lifted up this morning, and for all the ways my words have fallen short, we turn it all over to you, trusting that even when we don't say it right or say it at all, that you know, you know what we need. God, be with us as we continue in worship and as we join together in song, singing the prayer your son taught us. acknowledge one another in the reflection of the divine in one another by standing and greeting those around us in peace. I you to head back to your pews, but you can remain standing. Head on back to your pews or remain standing. And we are going to close out worship with number 3002 in the green songbook, Blessed Be Your Name. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful where your streams of, of abundance flow. 
blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing part. closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, blessed be your name. In the land that is plentiful, oh, me, and world as it should be, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, through the pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. may you know that the spirit, the breath of God goes with you. May you share that spirit with others, not with an agenda, but in knowing that it is through authentic relationship that God's love grows and thrives and endures forever. Amen. <laughs>